after the session on Bayesian linear regression. Before understanding uh, what is Bayesian linear regression, let's recap on what we did on the Quintest uh, linear regression or what we were also calling as a simple linear regression or uh, basis function uh, linear regression. Basis function linear regression is more of a uh, concept to come under Bayesian also and frequent uh, test also. But uh, let's understand on the recap of the what we were doing. And then we will understand what is the problem over there and what problems Bayesian uh, linear regression solved. Call it frequent test. Linear regression and everything that uh, we did on OLS and maybe G square or even on FP regression, we are part of this. So, what we did over there is uh, we used model Y as a function of X, and uh, in doing that, we computed our loss function and we said loss is equals to error plus regularization and in OLS there was only error and with the L1 and L2 regularization there was also a regularization and we said error is nothing but at WI minus omega which is our base transfer Square. If we're going for square error, we also had a discussion between types of error. But most of the regressions are created over the it's using square error. Okay. If we add a model uh, complexity penalty, which was a uh, regularization term for us, then in the case of suppose rigid regression, we were using lambda types. So this is what we were doing in our frequent test uh, But now understand what is the problem with this uh, approach. In this approach, suppose if I have uh, got some initial data. So this is my x and this is my y. Okay. This was having some data distribution. We were just fitting a line from here. And we computed the maximum likelihood estimate of this W. And on the basis of this maximum likelihood estimate of W, so W here is like a vector of W0, comma W1. Since this only has x, so x got uh, multiplied with w1 and this becomes your intercept. So essentially, this is your w1 and the intercept, which is a slope, to be w, uh, w1. So this is your maximum likelihood. So w maximum likelihood will give you this particular uh, line. Now, see the essential problems in uh, this particular case. So the first problem that is over there is we are talking about a single uh, prediction for a value whereas we have seen that even from the existing data we have got a bunch of data over here and here the bunch of data is very tight and we have a narrow confidence there. so if we are trying to see the confidence of this so we should be actually doing something like this so these are my possible values of y here we do not have any data okay? so here there shouldn't be like any uh, narrow bands on the continent, we do not know anything about y. It could be anything. It should actually expand if we do not have it to tell, or there should be some number that we cannot predict, or if we have uh, some confidence of the prediction. Then here again, we have some data, but here if you see, the bands are much wider as compared to here. Okay. And then we again do not have any data. So again, the band should actually go. So in case if a new data comes to us and which says x is suppose uh, somewhere around here. So on this line suppose I am given an x over here. 
so currently my model is just returning this value so from the wml okay, y given wml of xi or x unknown i xc1 unknown 1 this is my xc1 y1 something was there but from the model that I had fitted, I had actually no basis that given x over there, y can be over there. I do not have any confidence. Okay, so this is the problem that Bayesian uh, regression, either linear regression or uh, whatever regression you want to do, linear basis regression or whatever, would solve. It will tell us that uh, although we can give you something like this, and if we want, it will give us a similar number. And we'll talk about that also. But alongside that, we can also see that the, the confidence bands are very wide. It could be like anything over there. And the better thing would be to actually give a discoveted number. And that is our second distinction. So this was our first distinction. One number versus the confidence uh, bands. And the second distinction is this itself. So where your frequentist regression, all this class that we did, maximum likelihood did. Estimate this of the contest would also be called the maximum likelihood. Was giving us like one number. So it will, Bayesian regression will give us the whole confidence band of the numbers. Okay, and each area can have a different confidence band. Whereas in the case of frequentist, we had one uh, value which was say error, how good or how bad it is, or in the case of say. If you're going by a R square way, then adjust your R square for the model. Or if you're going for a logistic regression, you can have like whatever we want, accuracy or F measures. But this is for the whole model, irrespective of what data and where the data it was. Okay. Whereas in this particular case, it can tell you the certainty over a particular area of the prediction that it is giving. It can give you like one prediction also, it can give you the range of prediction, and that range could be different for different values of uh, extent. Okay. Third thing also should be evident from this graph, which is on heteroscedasticity. What is heteroscedasticity? Heteroscedasticity is, is your variance of the data is actually changing across the data levels. Then can you do a good job in prediction? So most of your linear models has uh, this uh, assumption that they could not do it. They want a linear thing. Even in Bayesian, we will start modeling with the uh, linear uh, sort of a error. But with X uh, having a variance, automatically some sort of a variance would start creeping inside it. And that is why these bands are coming. Okay. Now let's understand the practical side uh, situation out of it. So the practical situation, suppose uh, let's assume a use case. So this is, suppose I am in a corrosion room, reliability engineer. So in reliability engineer, suppose this is my pipe. This has, suppose some wear out or the tolerance is you know, somewhere over here. This is my pipe thickness. This thickness also. Now, and if I measure this thickness of the pipe which is left, most of the tools would not give you one thickness. It will give you thickness plus an error. Okay, what is the tolerance of that? Tool? And in any practical scenario, this error would be actually a function of the thickness distribution. Because each tool is uh, made of some particular material which is made to measure a uh, particular range of thickness and uh, it will have error which is a function of what it is measuring itself. Okay. So that is so one of the criteria. So if we are talking about this particular model, this is essentially called a first order reliability. Most of the people actually simplify it into first order reliability management but essentially a real life scenario is a second one. Let's understand a second use case where you are into supply chain. Okay. 
Now suppose from going from A to B, there is a distance which are probabilistic distance or time. Okay. So I take uh, on an average 10 days uh, from uh, for a ship to travel between distance A to B. Now depending upon what is the condition of the sea and so on and so forth, I have may have to take different routes for A to B. There might be one route which may require 50 other route which may require 20 days. Now the variance in each of these routes okay, now can be quite different or even for the same route depending upon what speed you are doing. So suppose this requires an RPM of say uh, 100. If I go at a lower RPM say 50 I get something like this speed. If I go at uh, something in between 70 RPM this is now because of uh, this time now the uncertainty increases because uh, between 10 to 15 days or 10 to 20 days the weather can go wrong and other things could, could go wrong so a more realistic condition is that the predictions would actually vary by uh, time but these models don't actually take that into consideration whereas Bayesian models could be actually trained to do uh, so, sort of thing. so now we will uh, go into the details of our assumption of Bayesian and then we will see how do we do it. So at its simple, what was based on if you uh, people remember, it says that A given B would be model as B, B given A. This is based on right. So this is called a prior. This is a posterior. This becomes the likelihood. This of the probability and the normalization factor. Okay. Now Let's assume uh, what we were doing in our OLS or frequent test uh, sort of a regression was we were finding the most likelihood value of uh, WML, which is that uh, if W is a vector of W1 or W0, W1, we have got specific values of this, and those specific values came from gradient descent. We discussed about the contours and gradient descent, and we reached the center of them. So we do not have a distribution sub out around W0 or W1. We consider that it's a one more uh, number. In fact, in all of these differentiation sort of a, uh, approaches of getting specific numbers, if you get multiple solutions, that creates more problems. An ideal scenario is that you get only one uh, number that will solve your uh, computational problem and uh, other mathematical interactability problems. So we got only one number, which is W1 and uh, W0 and W1. We do not know any world outside or how probable this W0, W1 and uh, numbers outside uh, uh, close to W0, W1 could be. And this is the problem that we are trying to solve with Bayesian um, model. So what we do is, we assume that W0 is not one number, it's actually a distribution. Similarly, W1 is also not one number, but it's actually a distribution. Okay. And any amount, uh, that's any of the normal distribution. So suppose it's a Gaussian distribution, would be actually equal by two comments. Okay. So this is one sigma one. Okay. And my W is nothing but any combination of this and this. So suppose I get one number from here. Suppose it's probability. We know the probability distribution of uh, any Gaussian uh, curve, so we get the probability of this the PDF uh, from the PDF. Suppose this is one uh, W1. Okay. Now, if you combine this W0, so W0i, or let's use some other W01, and this is W11, then we can compute the probability of getting this combination W01, W11, okay. which will be the probability of getting W01 multiplied by the probability of getting W1. So likewise we can have like different combinations of uh, W. Ok, 
okay and we can have the probability of each of these two and since these are gaussian in nature the most likely uh, part of this w0 is this the most likely part of w11 is again this mean okay so here it is w1 mean w0 mean and this most likely part is exactly what this was without what we were getting into the likelihood estimate or your equivalence method okay which is nothing but in our case we will call it a wmap or maximum a posteriori estimate maximum a posteriori so what is a prior and posterior over here? Let's discuss over there. And this was just an explanation to make things simpler for us. Uh, w is a vector, so we'll see it in a vector notations. And we saw that uh, how do we uh, define things in multi-dimensional if you want to see and probability distribution of uh, two uh, dimensional things, that is two contours. So if I have, uh, this is W0 and this is W1 and I'm mapping W, which is this particular vector over here. I see it in contours now. And my density or the probability in this particular case would be given by colors. So suppose this would be my center, which is the MAP value that we saw. Maximum MAP, which will be also the combination of maximum likelihood in this particular case. So this combination of this W0, W1 is what we are showing as this dot over. Okay. And similarly, it will keep expanding the contours. So these are lesser likely combinations. What we are These are complete contours. It will have one uh, number of W0, W1. But the probability all around us is same. Okay, that is what the uh, function of this contour. Okay, this is a very important concept. Uh, if you did not understand that, uh, please pause the video, go back and see it again. Okay, because now entire things will be based about this probability distributions. So now we have got uh, from the Bayesian uh, analysis the probability uh, distribution of W. Okay. But we need to have some initial uh, distribution. So we will uh, now create everything in the form of distribution. So when we are calling a probability of getting a particular Y that we were seeing, so in this particular case, the diagram that we draw, we are getting a probability of y given f. Okay. Now, this is not, we said an absolute number, but this is dependent upon what was the state of w over here. Okay. Now, what is the x that we want? And what is this condition upon two things? So, this is a conjugate prior. Okay. And uh, we understood from bias theorem, how can we expand it? So, if again, uh, recap. P, B by A is equals to P, A by B into P, B that is like P, A. Okay. So let's apply the same thing over here. In this particular case, P, Y given X and everything that is a conjugate uh, pair, you can, uh, and if that remains with one uh, only uh, posterior and this is the only prior, that becomes a prior as a conditional format. So we can write this in the form of P W given Y again. Okay. This will come over here. Okay. Into now what uh, the thing that has uh, was uh, down will come over here in the forms of probability, and here it is P Y into P Y now. X is the only thing left, so it is not a conjugate over here, it's a condition prior in this particular case. So probability of prior. This one is prior to this. Divided by again the X will act as a prior in this particular case. X is common. So this is a normalization factor or a cross over uh, vector. So what it is saying is that if we go to this 
again it is showing that y is actually not one uh, number but for each of these numbers we can give you a probability and that probability would be dependent upon the probability of your w which we computed over here is uh, dependent upon the probability of the w which is the combination of w0 and w1 so whatever over here suppose uh, for each of this it will have a probability that probability would again depend upon what is the data that it has got till now for uh, trading or what it has seen right so this is what this equation is saying okay so y is dependent upon w for x but w itself is actually dependent because w is changing with every new data that we get and that is why w is able to update it okay. so w is again the probability of our data y given and then uh, how do we actually resolve the circular dependency we say that w is actually a feature of a w prior because w prior was a feature uh, a function of the data data so with each iteration the probability distributions around w changes it sees our data and then it updates uh, itself okay i hope this concept is clear and we are assuming everything as a normal distribution so normal distribution will have a a uh, mean and a weightage around it so if we are talking about an absolute pw okay, which is the initial uh, state we can assume it as a gaussian distribution this is the simple for gaussian distribution of uh, w which is the initial uh, m0 and s0 which is s0 is the covariance matrix of the data that we have okay because all these uh, variance that we were talking about earlier this could be modeled by your covariance in the data. Okay. Now, the other part, the above one that we have written, this part, no. let's take this again. So we are saying P of Y given W comma X and here we will also introduce a precision there are two precision factors one is the alpha that will be used this is for the data and the second is the or the gaussian distribution of uh, y given x and this beta is for the gaussian distributions for your omega uh, w uh, with parameters okay so both are uh, gaussian assumption over here and what is precision precision is equals to one upon your variance Okay, and variance is uh, square of uh, standard deviation. Okay. And so, we, if we have to signify a particular uh, standard deviation or a variance, we can actually do something like a alpha minus one or beta minus one. So, whenever you see beta minus one, alpha minus one, you can see it's the variance of that particular Gaussian distribution of which it is coming. And now, if I have uh, suppose this data set, see some other color, you get confused. If we have this data set, suppose this is x1, then y1, x2, y2, and if these are independent, what is the probability of getting x1, y1, and x2, y2 will be the probability of x1, y1 multiplied by x2, y2 because these are independent. So, for this also, we we'll use because these are all independent in nature. It's a product of n is equals to one to all the elements in the data. This is the probability. You can see that particular thing. And this is a Gaussian distribution. So again, we'll use Gaussian notation into your the data set itself. Data given. Data is again y given x. So whenever you say data, it will be y given x is so data. Make the transpose, and if we have brought down the class, we do not want to now uh, call it only uh, linear regression, but can be a, any linear basis regression also. And simple linear regression is a subclass of uh, linear basis regression. Uh, please refer to our video on regularization and uh, bias variance state of We talked about all that. 
sigma of x n. Here we are assuming for simplicity that there is only one how basis function, but you can assume like uh, increase of complexity. Comma your beta minus one. We explain what is beta minus one. Right? It is a variance of uh, this uh, distribution. So similarly, let's uh, do for the probability of the W also. Given this data. Data here is y comma x or y given x, whatever you want to say. In general, it will be a normal distribution. We say that m, the mean and the covariance matrix at the nth step. So this n denotes at the nth step because what we are assuming is that with every step, w itself is updating itself. It sees new data and it sees that if this is the y and the x given. Uh, and it my initial estimate of the w was somewhere around here so with this y and x what should be my near estimate of them so this is exactly what we are doing so if we had something like this okay as our estimate of uh, w given x now we got uh, w0 and w1 okay and if you are seeing from a line perspective of course this is w0 the intercept and the slope is w1 and we have got this uh, Say x. Okay. Now you get another x, which might be something very different. So now I have got one x over here, or some x is over here. Now its estimate will change. So now if you say it, this line doesn't look something like this, but this line looks something like this. Because we had initial data somewhere uh, over here. Now we have got new data over here. Now it will change the probabilities of its w0 and w1 combination. So now it is saying that uh, W0 remains the same, but let's actually increase the probability of W1, which means take this curve somewhere over higher. So now these contours will look something around here. Okay, so this is higher than uh, this one. Uh, this is an important concept. You'll not find this in book. I'm just trying to put it graphically for you. How these uh, Ws are changing uh, with new data. Okay, so if you do not understand, just uh, pause the video and listen it to it very carefully okay this would be updated in this particular case with each step now at each step uh, what is the assumption uh, so let's uh, start with the initial assumption initially i do not have seen i have not seen any uh, data at all okay so i can just assume that i have a w0 and w1 which is a normal distribution centered across zero why because if you do not have any data and if you try to fit a line uh, in that data, what you will get? W0 is equals to 0 and W1 is equals to 0. This is the line you will get, okay? which is a, a straight line across the origin. If you get only one data, you cannot uh, do anything about the uh, intercept, you will keep it 0, only this will update. Only if we have two data points, then you will get some values now. So our initial assumption is that it is a uh, zero centered. Uh, and it has so that uh, beta minus one uh, it's a precision. Okay, so this was our W zero assumption, M zero. But with each of these steps, uh, it is actually doing a, a multiplication of this with your initial uh, data uh, probabilities vector. So what it will become in the form of final state, my or M n at any given step. Would become your SN and what was uh, S0? S0 was the sorry, it's the initial uh, covariance matrix. Again, we can put one over here. So this will become SN into S0 inverse okay, M0 plus. Now this is your x matrix into the, the y vectors we will call it target vectors the initial that we have got in the data okay. and your final s n and we will do a s n minus one you can take an inverse to get an s it is simpler in this particular case zero plus one plus times sigma transpose into sigma okay 
now we will not go into the derivation of this but try to understand it uh, intuitively what is happening so you have got one uh, your feature vector okay and if i am taking a transpose and multiplying with it i am trying to see a uh, natural permutations of the uh, the combinations of the uh, probabilities that is of that particular data i multiplied it with my uh, precision of the data how uh, close uh, it is so if it is a very tightly packed data the variance is uh, very less i'll see a lesser movement across this point and my essence inverse will be closer to my initial uh, but if the data has a lot of variability the covariance matrix is uh, very high then you'll see a larger shift on uh, these assets so this is proxy of the uh, final shift in the data or the confidence of uh, the w's which is based on the confidence of the how much data has actually the, the covariance of the uh, data and how much it has shifted similarly for sn sn would be again a function of uh, sn because it is the covariance of the final uh, thing that we are seeing and this is the initial uh, point so this is the intuition behind this we will not go into the detailed uh, derivation of and if we are going to solve this and we are going to compute the WMAP which is the maximum a posteriori estimate of this okay, this will be similar to what we have seen uh, in the case of say uh, your uh, frequentist uh, uh, regression but with uh, one single change that uh, we do not have to actually compute uh, our uh, uh, regularization in this particular case okay so let's come to that particular uh, derivation and that was one of the advantages that uh, we didn't mention but we forgot to mention but we can actually that is one of the advantages in case of Bayesian we do not have to adjust our, our lambda okay so whereas in the case of frequent test we were using a lot of cross validation data to get to the best combination of bias and variance so this was a bias square and this was our variance so see our lecture on bias variance uh, a trade-off and this was the final error so we were using a lot of cross validation to get some sense of this particular uh, area to get to the optimal point here in the case of uh, our uh, Bayesian we don't have to do it and it will automatically give us uh, a probability of WT or let's say a log probability of WT because that is what we were doing in the likelihood also which will be equivalent to your beta by 2 summation the error function would be a similar thing. summate the error over all the data points and what was the error it was the target minus the predictions of the target which for the basis function thing we were getting from basis function of x in whatever is there and we were squaring it for a square error okay. minus times alpha by 2 into and we can add some constant over here so this was a regularization or l2 regularization but this factor was not over there so if you were to bring this factor over here okay and we were to take all this constant outside because it doesn't matter because when you are optimizing it this constant uh, will go so what will be the regularization factor that will be left over here so with alpha by beta regularization your passion will give you the same central line as your frequent tests this was the data this is the data okay and if it, this is my say a Bayesian estimate of this data so this is a with probability distribution I'm trying to say okay. so here the probability distribution will be wide because we do not have seen any data here it will come narrow here it will again go wide then come slightly narrow not as narrow as this much because the data itself was uh, 
having a lot of uh, values and we take a WMAP of uh, this maximum apply the estimate we will get the same line in the case of uh, WML provided we see our lambda is equals to uh, alpha by theta okay so what are the three benefits again that we got number one we didn't have to adjust for our overfitting so there's an over automatic treatment for overfitting over and if it is an automatic treatment for overfitting it's just not giving you a number it is actually giving you the confidence bands With the confidence band, obviously, with each, uh, uh, if you see the confidence of the probabilities, or those probabilities, you can get like probabilistic values of points. Okay. The fourth advantage over here is that's a pure online algorithm. So, with every new X that is coming, it can actually do a prediction also, and it will use that X to update its uh, priors on your y given x also and then also uh, the priors uh, if the posterior of your w given your previous uh, uh, the uh, value of w or the probabilities not sorry value but the uh, distributions of w 